Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, suddenly... Two men stood by them in dazzling clothes, so the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? asked the men. He is not here, but he has been resurrected. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day? And they remembered his words. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. And when he stooped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. So he went home amazed at what had happened. Now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. And then he asked them, What is this dispute that you're having with each other as you were walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? What things, he asked them. So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. And he said to them, How unwise and slow you are to believe in your hearts all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going further. But they urged him, stay with us, because it's almost evening, and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. When their eyes were opened... <clears throat> And they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. So they said to each other, Weren't our hearts ablaze within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together who said, The Lord has certainly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And as they were saying these things, he himself stood among them and he said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Why are you troubled, he asked them. And why, are you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet. But while they could, but while... They still could not believe because of their joy and were amazed. He asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and they took it and ate in their presence. And then he told them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms might be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he also said to them, This is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You're witnesses of these things. And look, I am sending you what my Father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. I'm not the swiftest person in the world, especially when it comes to my walk with the Lord. 
I have a tendency to sometimes to doubt or to forget. That's one of the reasons I love telling folks how the Lord worked in the previous week. Speaking of which, let me tell you what God did this week. I uh, run from job site to job site often with the roofing company that I work for. And you'll normally see my truck full of junk. I'll have shingles in the back of it, perhaps some underlayment. A lot of times plywood and two by fours. Every once in a while, you'll even see some one by sixes in the back of my truck. And then, uh, day before yesterday, I had had a friend call me, ask me to come over to their house. Said she, they were having trouble with their uh, doorknobs on the front of their uh, on their front door, and she was afraid that. Uh, if someone was not home and she came home that she would be locked out because the lock was no longer working with her key and asked if I'd come and change it for her. So I went and, and changed the doorknob for she and her husband. And while I was there, her husband said, uh, Gene, while you're here, would you mind changing our mailbox for us as well? I said, gentlemen, you know what it's like. Once they start with the honeydews, they got a list. Don't ever, don't ever start. It, it's just opening a can of worms. I said, okay, I'll fix that too. So I went and took off the old mailbox. They had a one by six on the top of it. The new mailbox had a space on the bottom, but it required a one by eight. A one by six would not be able to fasten it ad adequately. Interesting thing. I had just left a job in Longwood. We had done a job three weeks ago over in New Smyrna Beach where on the roof, they, instead of plywood, they had had one by eight boards. There were some boards, one by eights left over from that job, and our, one of our subcontractors had carried those extra boards to that job in Longwood, and I had just picked them up 20 minutes before I was working on that mailbox. God knew what I needed and when I needed it, and He provided it exactly when it was needed day before yesterday um, when I came to the house between jobs I walked into the house going to grab me a sandwich real quick there was an envelope sitting there in front of my computer I went and opened the envelope it was a note in there from our director of missions and it was a check for $500 and a note that said Gene I want to put this toward Christmas in the country to help y'all win more people for Jesus this Christmas. The other day, I went to Lowe's to pick up some 4 before This year, our, our um, heroes wall is going to be along this side of the maze where we put up, up all the flags for the military and the law enforcement and all of that. And I've been told I needed to get six 16-foot 4 before to put up along there, and I went to get some and uh, I didn't buy six, I only bought four. It cost me just under $80 for those four boards. I got home and Gladys said, Gene, you're short. You need two more. I said, well, baby, let me tell you what happened while I was at Lowe's. She said, what? I said, when I got through buying those four and I went to load them up in the truck, the guy from the lumber department came out and said, uh, Gene, we're fixing to have inventory. I got some lumber in, uh, back here behind the building that, that I need to get rid of, some coals, and I'll give you a really good deal on them. I said, okay, let me take a look at them. I walked back there, and back there were five 16-foot 4 befores. There were four 12-foot 4 befores. There were some 10-footers. There were some 4 by 6s I got a whole cart of the stuff for just a little bit more than I paid for those four boards. So the Lord knew that we needed those. He knew that we needed posts for the maze. He knew that we needed some more lumber for the deck that we're building out here. Let me tell you how God worked this week. Three days ago, I had a pastor call me from, or text me from Sanford. Carl Kadoff is his name. He's a friend of mine. He runs, a, a, in addition to pastor in the church, he oversees a coffee shop there in Sanford. All of the people who work in that coffee shop are volunteers. All of the money that is raised through that coffee shop goes to support ministry in South America, helping women come out of the sex trade industry to help rescue those women. He called me or texted me on Wednesday. He said, Gene, he said, I got a whole bunch of... Um, 
tar paper, felt, 15 pound felt here, and I know that y'all are in the roofing business, so there ain't chance that you can use it. It was donated to us, and I'm trying to raise some money. I said, Carl, we don't ever use that anymore. All we ever use is the artificial stuff. He said, okay, I understand. Next day, I was talking to my boss. We're getting ready to do a roof, an old board roof for an old church in Enterprise. He said, I want to use tar paper on this roof. I said, really? I know where we can get some. He said, all right, go and get it. A pastor called, said, I want to sell this stuff to support this ministry. I said, we can't use it. And then God said, wait a minute, Gene, I got a place for you to use it. I love to watch how God works. And the reason I share these stories is because I so quickly forget and can be discouraged and miss where God is working around me all the time. And I want to share the story so that I will remember and so that I will be encouraged that God is in charge of all things and at work around us all the time. And perhaps you, like me, are sometimes forgetful and discouraged. I want to remind you to look for the little ways that God is working around you each day. For it is through remembering the little things that we are challenged and encouraged to take on the big jobs. Do you remember when uh, David went to stand before Goliath and Saul called him in and he said, David, you can't go and stand against that giant. He's been a soldier since his youth and you're just a boy. David said, no, no. He said, man, when I was a shepherd, I fought against a lion and a bear. And if God gave me victory over those things, this uncircumcised Philistine will be no more difficult than they were. We look for the little things and the simple things to be encouraged and challenged and reminded that God can handle the big things as well. And that is one of the reasons that I so enjoy this chapter. Because being so simple myself, God has made several things in this chapter very clear. So that even those of us like myself who may not be the deepest thinkers in the world can recognize that God is at work. And one of the lessons that I saw in this passage, one of the things I was reminded of in this chapter is that though Jesus may get frustrated, he doesn't give up. Though he sometimes may be frustrated with us, God doesn't give up. How long had Jesus been with the disciples? How long had Jesus been with the disciples? How many years had they walked with him? Three years. Three and a half years. They had seen Jesus do miracles. They had seen him do phenomenal things. They had seen him speak to the wind and the waves and they instantaneously became still. They had seen Jesus walk on the water. They had seen him stand at the opening to Lazarus' tomb and speak to this man who had been dead four days and seen a dead man come up from the grave. They would seen him take a few loaves and fish and break it and with that feed more than 5,000 people. They'd seen him turn water into wine. They'd seen him give sight back to the blind. They'd seen him cure lepers. They'd seen him do miracles again and again and again. And yet when Jesus stands before them, they are scared to death and cannot believe that he's really risen from the dead. What did Jesus do? He says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I was at the tomb this morning. I had the angel speak to two of the women. One of the women I even showed myself to. Y'all had Peter and John. They came to the tomb. It was empty. And they came back and testified to all of that. And y'all don't believe that I've risen from the dead? The two guys, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, I walked with them. And as I walked with them, I explained all of the scriptures about the, the prophecies of my coming and how I was to suffer and to die. I explained all of it to them. If you look at the verse right before what we just read, you'll see they were there in the midst of the disciples and had just got through telling them the story of their encounter with Jesus. 
And Jesus said, in spite of all of that, you still don't believe that I've risen from the dead? Here, look at the, the nail holes in my hands and my feet. Look at the gash in my side. And what do they do? <laughs> no, somebody else can look. And Jesus in his frustration says, do y'all have something to eat? And they give him fish and he eats it. He has to go to all of that extent to prove to them that he is alive? And yet they never gave up on him. I don't know about y'all, but I'm grateful that even when I get discouraged and forgetful and don't understand, that God doesn't give up on me. That's one of the reasons I think the Lord does things like provide the lumber and and have people say they want to come help or whatever because they know how quickly, because he knows how quickly I can be discouraged. And he says, Gene, <laughs> I know you got issues, but I've not given up on you. Still gonna use you. I am happy for this passage of scripture. Because through it I'm reminded that even though Jesus may get frustrated sometimes at our lack of faith or our slowness to believe that he doesn't give up on us. There's something else I'm excited about seeing when I look at this passage and that is that I'm not the only one who has this struggle. Look there again if you will. Verse 36 And as they were saying these things, he himself stood among them and he said to them, Peace be with you. Two of the disciples that Jesus had revealed himself to who had explained all of scriptures had just got through explaining all of this to the disciples. And while they were doing it, Jesus stood in their midst. And the disciples still doubted. You know, sometimes when we go through times of, of doubt or uncertainty or wondering where God is, it's very easy to, to begin to question ourselves and ask, am I the only one who has these struggles? A am I the only one that, that misses seeing God or, or, or wonders why God isn't working in this situation? A am I the only one that gets discouraged? And I'm reminded that when we go through times of discouragement or depression or frustration or wondering where God is, that we're not the only ones to have those questions. You remember Elijah? There in the Old Testament. Elijah is the one who prayed and for three days, uh, for three years, it did not rain. He prayed and it did not rain. And then he prayed and it started raining again. He's the one who stood on the top of Mount Carmel and he built an altar. And he, he put a, 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 a steer on top of the altar. Or put a, a cow, an ox on top of the altar. And he had them pour water all over it. And then he knelt down and prayed. And God sent fire from heaven and devoured the, the sacrifice, devoured the wood, devoured the altar itself, and all of those hundreds of priests that he was standing against, God had them all destroyed. And yet we find right after performing those miracles that the queen threatened his life and this great man of God that God used in miraculous ways, he said, God, just take me home. I, I can't handle it anymore. A man that works those kind of miracles, seeing God's hand in his life in that way, and he was discouraged. We remember John the Baptist. John the Baptist, even before he was born, knew who Jesus was. You remember? He was in his mother's womb, and her, his mother's cousin, Mary, came to visit while she was carrying Jesus. And as soon as she heard Mary's call of greeting, John the Baptist jumped in his mom's womb. Remember? 
This is the one who, when he saw Jesus coming, says, Behold the Lamb of the world. Remember? Or the Lamb of God. Remember? This is the one who, who looked at Jesus and said, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. This is the one who baptized Jesus. The one who heard God speak from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is the one who saw the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove come and rest on Jesus' shoulder. This is the one who said, He must increase, but I must decrease. And yet John, when he was arrested and put in prison, sent his disciples to Jesus to ask him, Are you the one? Or are we to look for someone else? Oh, I'm reminded that when I have my doubts or my frustrations or wonder sometimes where God is or what he's doing that I'm not the only one. And that in spite of those struggles that God can still use us. The Lord took these 11 men in this upper room and he turned the Roman Empire upside down. Those soldiers and those people who were persecuting Christians, who later arrested them, who, who had them tied to stakes and put on fire just three centuries later, Christianity became the national religion of Rome. Because God used these weak and doubting men to change the world. Just because you have struggles or doubts or sometimes or discouraged and wonder where God is does not mean that He cannot use you. Does not mean you won't come out on the other side and change the world. Oh. As I look at this passage of Scripture, there's something else I am reminded of. Look there again, if you will, please. In verse 36, And as they were saying these things, he himself stood among them, and he said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Why are you troubled, he asked them, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, but while they could still not believe because of their joy and were amazed, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and they took it and ate it in their presence. And then he told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day. And repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. Third, I am reminded of the message we are called to share. There are many good things a person can learn from the Bible. The Bible covers all aspects of life. And as a church, as a body of believers, there are many scriptures we can use to help people. There are all kinds of lessons in the Bible about parenting about how we are to treat our children. There is guidance in the Bible for marriage and for relationships between husbands and wives. There is guidance we can find on how to relate to our neighbors and how we are to treat them. The Bible has a whole bunch to say about money and finances. And following the, the guidance of the scriptures can help us get our, our finances on a firm footing. The Bible talks about government and how it relates to citizens. It talks about relationships between employers and employees. There are all kinds of things the Bible covers that would help a person whether they are a believer or not. And I believe that we as Christians and as a church, we can help people in all these areas. However, that is not the world's greatest need, nor is it our most important message. Look there again. 
verse 47. And repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. What is man's greatest need? And why did Jesus come in the first place? Why did he suffer and die? So that you and I could be reconciled to God. Jesus came because we have all sinned. In Romans chapter 3 verse 23 we read, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And again we are told there is none righteous, no not one. Second, we are told that there is a punishment for sin. And that is death. Romans 6.23 we read, For the wages of sin is death. Eternal separation from God. We are also told that there is an atonement for sin. In John 3.16 we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay the price for your sins and mine. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And fourth, there is an escape from sin. In 1 John 1, 9, we are told if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we're told if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart God has raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. How do we escape? Through confession and through making Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives. The Lord makes things simple so that even simple people like me can see them and understand simple truths even though Jesus may be frustrated with us he doesn't give up and even though those who know him best can sometimes get anxious or forgetful and third we remember what this is all about we remember what's most important a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, my friend. Do you know that you know that you know without a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today that you'd spend eternity with Christ? If you don't, would you nail that down today? Would you say, Lord, please forgive me of my sins? I know that I've been living a life apart from your will. Lord, please forgive me. And I want to make you Lord of my life. Let me ask you this. Those of you who think of yourselves as Christ followers. Those of you who believe yourselves to be Christians. Let me ask you. When was the last time you told somebody the most important message of all? That they can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That someday he's going to come again. They need to get that relationship nailed down right now.